I'll, I'll do some introductions and then we'll dig into learning about insects. Um, so again, my name is Holland Gestelli and um, I am the education specialist at Pepperwood and you are here today. So welcome to our intro to insects class. And um, so Pepperwood is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to advance science-based conservation throughout our region and beyond. And we work towards this mission through three pillars of our work, research, education, and community. So we research the climate, the water, um, wildlife, plants to, um, in order to make better decisions about how to care for our environment. We have education programs such as this one that you're part of today, and we have others for all ages, from elementary school students to teenagers to college students to adults and everyone in between. Um, so thanks for joining us. And community. So our volunteers are critical to our work in pretty much every, every area of our work. Um, and we also have an awesome membership program that I invite you to check out. Um, it in, includes special events throughout the year, discounts on classes and things like that. So thanks for being part of our community today. And Pepperwood, the preserve itself is located in Santa Rosa, California. It's 3,200 acres and home to over 900 species of plants and animals, including insects. Um, and we hope that you can join us in person up there someday um, when we're all able to gather together again. And so without further ado, that brings me to introduce Elliot. So Elliot Smeds is our instructor today. Elliot was born and raised here in Sonoma County and has been fascinated with its landscapes and wildlife since before he could speak. While he tries to be something of a jack of all trades naturalist, his passion for entomology has guided most of his scientific endeavors. Currently, he's earning a master's degree at Sonoma State University, studying Sierra willow leaf beetles and their response to climate change. As part of his studies, he works as a laboratory instructor and curates the university's entomology collection. He has participated in educational outreach events and led guided hikes at Bouverie Preserve in Glen Ellen and Mayakamas Mountains Preserve in Healdsburg. So without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it off to Elliot so he can uh, begin his presentation. Let's see here, I'll do this. Thank you, Holland. Uh, yeah. Welcome everybody, thank you. Uh, for joining us on this strangely rainy late May morning. Ah, I think, Holland, you're gonna have to um, enable screen sharing for me. Oh, yep, yeah. here we go. Advanced sharing options. Allow Elliot to share. Okay, try that now. <laughs> All right, there we go. Great. All right, can we see that okay? Awesome. All right, so um, our presentation today is kind of just an introductory um, class about insects, about um, their basic sort of form and the different, the different common groups that we have around here and, and some basic um, tips and tricks for how to identify them and how to, um, how to document them. Um, and I've tried to structure this um, slideshow in a way that will hopefully um, be visible even with the little webcam icon. But if you guys uh, find that during the course of the presentation that your, um, some of the content is obscured by the um, little video up in the corner, you can just try maybe making it smaller or moving it farther up out of the way. Or I believe there's even an option to minimize it completely if that's less distracting for you. So our basic outline for today's presentation, um, we're gonna talk about first off, off what insects are in the first place, what distinguishes them from other sorts of invertebrates. I'm gonna run through um, just sort of the most common insect orders. We wouldn't have time to go through every single insect order that you can find, but these are gonna be the ones that you um, come across most often. 
around here. Um, I'm going to give you just a few resources, both um, some printed um, resources for identifying insects, as well as some very useful online resources, and give you a few tips for the best practices for photographing and documenting insects that you find. So first off, what is an insect? You know, we, as we go about our lives, we have, you know, lots of encounters with all sorts of little creepy crawly um, creatures. And there's definitely, I think, a, a, a cultural sort of uh, lack of knowledge about the sort of finer classifications and um, distinguishing features of these different invertebrate groups. So um, when we talk about insects specifically, we're talking about animals that are um, arthropods. So they have this hard exoskeleton made of this uh, substance called chitin. And this produces this rigid um, outer skeleton that um, cannot grow with the animal. So as it gets larger, it has to um, periodically shed that exoskeleton in order to grow into its new, new size. So if you go out into your garden and you find something like a snail um, that does not have any sort of hard exoskeleton on it, it has a shell, but the rest of it is fairly soft. Um, it doesn't need to worry about um, molting or shedding an exoskeleton in order to grow. So that's very clearly not an insect. Insects are also um, what are we called hexapods, um, which hexapod just means that they have six legs. And this is pretty distinctive as far as arthropods go. Most arthropods will have anywhere from eight to 10 to um, over a hundred legs if you're talking about something like a centipede. Um, so having those six legs is going to distinguish almost all arthropods from insects. So if you were to go out in your garden and find, say, a, a pill bug or a roly-poly, you can see it has more than six legs, so it is not an insect. Insects also have three very well-defined body regions, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The legs of an insect are always going to be connected to the thorax. It will have one pair of antennae that are always connected to the head. And the abdomen, for the most part, is not going to have any kind of appendages or structures on it. There are a few exceptions, but the only true limbs that the insect has are going to be on the thorax. And that's also where the wings come off. Speaking of which, wings are a very important distinguishing feature for most insects. Um, and that was a really, really important um, step for them evolutionary evolutionarily speaking. Um, and there are a few insect groups that don't have wings. Um, some of the really, really ancient groups like the silverfish um, were present before the evolution of wings and so they do not have them at all to begin with. And then there are a few more advanced groups like fleas, for instance, that um, have evolved a lifestyle where they do not require wings. In fact, the wings will kind of just get in the way, so they have lost those. And then one final um, really distinctive feature, um, there are certainly other in invertebrate groups that, that do this, but it's very pronounced in insects that they have these multiple life stages, um, which we call metamorphosis. And insect metamorphosis comes in two main forms for the vast majority of insects. We have what's called incomplete metamorphosis, or hemimetabolis, if you're being technical about it. And this is where you go from an egg to these smaller forms called nymphs, which really just look like sort of miniature versions of the adult. And then there's a final adult stage, which has full-sized wings. So if you find an insect that follows, you know, this sort of stage where the young, younger versions really just look like small wingless versions of the adults, 
that's incomplete metamorphosis. The second type, as you might guess, is called complete metamorphosis. And this introduces another stage. So first you have these larval stages, and then there will be a resting stage, which is called a pupa. And in that pupal stage, the insect will um, undergo very dramatic uh, restructuring in order to produce the adult form. And this is um, a very, very useful adaptation. Uh, one of the big things that it allows is for the larvae to kind of follow a different lifestyle than the adults. So in the case of the caterpillar, the caterpillar and a butterfly, the caterpillar will be feeding on leaves its whole life. And then once it turns into a butterfly, it will fly around and it can go feed on nectar. So the adults do not have to compete with their offspring for resources. So they can kind of hang out in separate, um, separate habitats and not have to interfere with each other's life, life stages as much. Whereas a grasshopper is going to be feeding on leaves the entirety of its life. So the adults are competing directly with the young. And <laughs> there are obviously quite a lot of insect groups. Insects are far and away the most successful multicellular organisms on the planet. And whenever you try and get into how insects are related to each other, you're gonna find very quickly that it's very complicated. And it's taken um, several, um, several decades of, of hard work for biologists to really start figuring out um, exactly how a lot of these groups are related to each other. And I'm not going to go into any of that detail here because it would take um, quite a long time for us to go through all of it. So I'm going to condense it down into the, the most basic things. So the very earliest insects, things like um, silverfish, these very primitive groups um, were around before the evolution of wings. And they have this um, very, very simplified life cycle. Um, the, there isn't really any kind of metamorphosis. They hatch out of the eggs. They look like tiny versions of the adults and they just keep growing throughout their lives looking exactly the same. Once insects evolved wings, the older, you know, original winged insects um, follow this incomplete metamorphosis. So they would have a nymph stage and then the adult stage. And then the complete metamorphosis evolved once, uh, much later, and all of, the, all of the insects that have complete metamorphosis are all descended from that same ancestor. So they're all related to one another. So we're gonna go through the um, sort of most common insect orders, and we're gonna start sort of in this um, evolutionary order with the older groups being the ones with complete, incomplete metamorphosis. And then we'll move on to the groups with complete metamorphosis after that. So our first group is the Odonata. These are um, very familiar to all of us. These are dragonflies and damselflies. They're pretty easily distinguished because they have four very long wings with these net-like veins and this very long, narrow abdomen. Um, all dragonflies and damselflies are predators that will fly around and they will snatch their prey out of the air. And they all have these aquatic life stages. So this is a um, nymph of a dragonfly. This is a nymph of a damselfly. And the sort of fancy term for a, a dragonfly or damselfly nymph is a, a naiad. And these were, um, again, one of the very old groups of insects um, and were not exactly the first um, group to sort of evolve the flight and um, these very advanced wings and the ability to move around in the air, but certainly the most successful at it in the early days. And they've been tremendously successful ever since. Another common group that we encounter are the earwigs, the Dermaptera. 
And dermaptera, the word means um, skin wing or leather wing. And this is due to the fact that they have these sort of leathery um, wing cases that cover their hind wings. And I'm guessing some of you probably didn't even realize that your wings had these um, wings. Um, they're normally very, very tightly folded up underneath the, the four wings. Um, and they're kind of spring loaded. So once the, once the earwig decides it wants to fly, they'll kind of spring out and it will um, take off. And the other really um, common distinguishing feature are these um, pincers on the end of the abdomen, which are called cirque. And earwigs are omnivorous. They'll eat, um, they'll eat decaying plant matter. They'll eat decaying animals. Um, some of them will hunt, some of them will feed on pollen. Um, and they are mostly nocturnal. So they'll spend most of the day tucked away in crevices. And then once night falls, they will come out and start foraging. The next group is the Orthoptera. These are the crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. And these are very easy to distinguish because they have these long jumping legs. And all of them are herbivorous. Um, they all feed on plant matter. Some of them are actually um, pretty significant agricultural pests. I think all of us are familiar with the uh, locusts and their ability to form these giant swarms. And this is one of the two main groups of insects that will um, communicate with each other using sound. And they achieve this by rubbing these file-like structures on their wings together um, to produce this sort of rasping noise, which is called stridulation. And uh, we, like to, we like to romanticize it a little bit and call it singing. Um, but it's um, actually a very useful tool for identifying uh, different kinds of orthopterans. You can sometimes tell the precise species of insect just by the sounds of its song. Our next group is the Dictyoptera. These are the mantises and the cockroaches, which make an odd pairing <laughs> when you first, um, first find out that they're related to one another. Uh, mantises, as we're probably all aware, are predators. Um, they will use these um, four legs, these raptorial appendages to um, snatch their prey and devour it. And cockroaches um, will kind of eat whatever. Um, they'll feed on, on plants and um, decaying, decaying detritus and things like that. Some of them can digest wood. They have these um, bacteria in their gut that help them to break down the cellulose in the wood. And Cockroaches tend to get kind of a bad rap because we're so used to them being sort of indoor pests. We generally regard them as kind of unsanitary. Um, but the truth is the vast majority of cockroaches are really, um, really harmless and beneficial organisms. And they're surprisingly social animals as well. Um, the parents are, are very uh, devoted to caring for their young. They will form these social groups, and um, some of them will form these very sophisticated uh, colonies um, that will work together and have um, different roles partitioned off to different members of the group. Um, and these are the cockroaches that we would call termites. Um, we've found out relatively recently um, through DNA evidence that cockroach or that termites are just a, a group of cockroaches that have evolved this really sophisticated social structure. Um, so that's um, one of my one of my favorite sort of unexpected facts in the insect world. Um, I kind of like to say that uh, termites are what happens when a cockroach tries to be an ant, and Mantises are what happens when a cockroach tries to be a velociraptor. This next group is the Hemiptera. 
And these are, um, if you ever meet someone who's trying to be overly pedantic, um, they might call you out if you refer to an insect as a bug, because if you're being really strict and um, technical about it, bugs are only members of the hemiptera. All other insects um, are not, you know, not technically referred to as bugs. I don't really care about that distinction, but in case you wanted to know, um, anytime you refer to one of these, you can call it a bug without feeling self-conscious. And they're all distinguished by having these mouth parts that are modified into kind of a long straw um, for piercing into either into a plant stem to suck out the sap, or there are some predatory insects that will um, stick it into, you know, a, another, uh, an insect, or in the case of a, a parasitic one like a bed bug into um, the skin of a mammal and will um, suck out the fluids inside. And this is a very, very diverse, very successful group. Um, aside from the those mouth parts, which are sometimes visible, sometimes not, you can also often tell that um, an insect is a bug by this sort of X shape that will form from the wings holding against each other. That's kind of a handy way to um, distinguish them. And they live in all kinds of different environments. Some of them, like the giant water bug and the water strider, are aquatic. Um, the assassin bug is a, an active predator that will search out prey. Um, the box elder bug will feed on plant sap, it will feed on nectar. Of course, most people are familiar with the bed bug. And this is also the other main group of insects that has members that will produce singing. This is, of course, cicadas, which are one of my favorite groups of organisms. And I realized I needed to update my sharing because I need to make sure I can get sound in here. Can everyone still see everything? Okay. All right, hopefully this will work, but I have a couple of sound recordings of cicadas. Um, it's, it, it's a, I found kind of a, a general misconception that California doesn't have um, any cicada species, um, and that's very untrue. It's mostly just because they are not nearly as loud, nearly as conspicuous as other um, cicadas that you will find back in the eastern United States but there are plenty of species of cicadas native to California. And I've got a couple of sound recordings here. So probably you would have heard some of, some of this over the last few weeks as the weather has gotten warmer. Does everyone hear that okay? So very different sounding from your normal cicada. Um, but we also have some of the slightly more standard sound. Uh, this, this recording is actually of this individual that I photographed here. Oh, oh dear. Very high pitched. Hopefully that wasn't too high pitched for most of you. Uh, but I, I love I love cicadas. I think they're just such fascinating animals. And the hemiptera in general are really interesting and, and a, a very successful group. So those are all of the um, hemimetabolous insects, the ones with incomplete metamorphosis that we'll go through. So before we transition, does anyone have any questions? All right, I'll unmute myself for a second here and um, take a look in the chat. We had a few comments of quite a few people were surprised to learn that um, earwigs have wings, me being one of them. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and then, um, a question that just came in is, are California cicadas on a 17-year cycle? That is an excellent question. So 
the 17 year cycle is a very, um, very distinctive thing to this particular genus of cicadas that live in the Eastern United States. Those are the periodical cicadas. And as far as we know, that is the longest life cycle <clears throat> that any um, cicada species has. And they are, it's pretty unusual as well for cicadas to have um, life cycles that are completely synchronized with one another. So the entire, like the entire species, the entire population will follow that same cycle. So you're not going to have staggered emergences. They're all going to emerge that same every 17 years and then they'll go away for the next period and then come out after the next cycle. The cicadas in California, um, as far as we know, don't have as, as long of a life cycle and most of them have overlapping, um, overlapping emergences. So there will be at least a few every year or most years. Um, some of them, especially down in Southern California, have reached a point where almost all of the population will emerge um, on a set cycle. This is called proto-periodical um, emergence. Um, and it's very likely that in the next few decades or few centuries, those um, smaller emergences that are in between will gradually die out and you will have completely periodical emergences from these species. But they will not follow that really long 17-year um, cycle. It'll be more like six or seven years. But cicadas in general, we um, don't have a lot of data on the lengths of their life cycles in general because it's going to be different for every species. And it's a very difficult thing to measure when you don't have them all synchronized very nicely. So it's still an area of active research. There's always something to study. Uh, another question here is, um, are there many invasive insects or bugs from other areas that outcompete our native insects? Absolutely. Um, certainly there are um, some agricultural um, pests that have been brought in. California is of course a, um, a state with a huge amount of agriculture and that's been how most of them were introduced. And um, some of those will end up getting out into the natural environment and causing issues. There are, you know, you'll, you'll think there's like um, things like tent caterpillar moths, um, I know are from the Eastern United States and got introduced here. And sometimes if you'll go out hiking, um, you'll find areas where like entire trees have been defoliated because these caterpillars have stripped them of all their leaves. Um, there are also some insect predators that have been released and, um, you know, will cause issues in, in the food chain, like um, the praying mantis eggs that you can buy at hardware stores a lot of the time or garden centers. Those are usually um, non-native insects and what happens is um, gardeners will release them into their garden and they will end up dispersing out into the local habitat and start preying on native insects and causing issues. So that's maybe a, a good thing to avoid if you're ever doing any kind of uh, gardening like that is if you're gonna if you're gonna introduce any predatory insects to take care of things like aphids then make sure that it is um, a native insect. Yeah, good point. Um, another question, this is a great like one for maybe anyone could answer in the chat as well, um, but what's your favorite insect? Oh, well, as I was just saying, my favorite are cicadas. I, uh, yeah, I just love them. They're just so interesting and it, it was, it was a very exciting thing to find out that they are so prevalent in California when it's, it's so, um, so easy to kind of not notice that, they, that they're here. 
So I'm, I'm really into, um, into them and also actively kind of studying them and trying to publish research. Great. Um, let's see. I think that covers most of the questions we've got at this point. Um, and yeah, I just want to be conscious of the time. So let's get in, into more. All right. So these next groups are going to be the sort of quote unquote more advanced or at least more recent um, insect groups. These are the ones with complete metamorphosis. So they have the larval stage, the pupa, and the adult stage. The first is everyone's favorite, the Lepidoptera, These are the moths and butterflies, or maybe more accurately, the moths, including butterflies, because butterflies are really just one group within the larger family that is moths. And these are distinguished by having these very beautiful large wings that are covered in um, these very fine scales. Here's a nice microscope picture that I found. Um, and this allows for these very intricate, very beautiful patterns to develop. Um, another distinguishing feature is that the larvae, the caterpillars, have these additional appendages on their abdomen, which are not true legs. If you see on this caterpillar, these three little things here, those are the actual legs of the caterpillar. So this is the thorax. This is all the abdomen, and these are what are called prolegs, which the caterpillar has to help it move around, but it will lose those as soon as it turns into an adult. Um, as you're probably all aware, caterpillars are herbivorous, they feed on plant matter, and then the adults, um, moths and butterflies will feed on things like nectar or sometimes um, tree sap, things like that. The next group are the Hymenoptera. These are the wasps and bees, ants, and then this um, slightly more primitive group that people are less familiar with, which are called sawflies. And these are um, distinguished mostly by this um, ovipositor that the females have, which they will use for laying eggs, but in a lot of the more familiar species has been modified um, to inject venom, that is the, the stinger. So that's a, a fun tip. Any, any wasp or bee that has a stinger has to be a female. Uh, the males do not have that structure. Um, another really handy trick for identifying them is, is for most wasps and bees and ants, um, the abdomen comes to this very narrow point, which forms this sort of waist. And um, that's kind of a handy trick for helping to identify if an insect belongs to this group. If the, the body is more sort of one cohesive unit, there's not a clear transition from the thorax to the abdomen as a sign, maybe it is not one of these. The exception are softwise, which have a more continuous body, but those are a lot less common, and so we're not going to encounter those as often. Uh, the vast majority of wasps are solitary animals, um, but the ones that are most familiar to us are the ones that form these very sophisticated um, social systems. This is the other, um, the other occurrence among insects of what's called eusociality, where you have like a queen and workers and soldiers and different, um, different castes in this colony that will all have a different role to play in keeping the, the hive or the nest um, functioning. And these, again, is another very diverse group. There are um, herbivores, there are lots of pollinators and lots of predators, and there are also parasitoids, which will um, find other insects and will lay their eggs inside them and then the young will grow inside the other insects and gradually, you know, feed on it as it gets larger. And probably you guys have been seeing in the news some, a uh, lot of media coverage about these um, murder hornets these Asian giant hornets that have been sighted in uh, Washington. And 
Well, there's sort of two things going on here. The first, of course, is the, the immediate sort of concerns about this species. And um, it is certainly um, dangerous for these Asian giant hornets to get introduced into our native ecosystems um, because they are um, very active predators and could, could cause a lot of damage to a lot of the native insect communities. So it is good for us to be concerned about it from an ecological perspective. But of course, most of the media has been focusing on the danger that they pose to humans. And the simple fact of the matter is that you need to be pretty irresponsible in order to get yourself in a position where um, wasps are going to cause any kind of serious harm to you. Um, and that's going to go for any kind of wasp. You know, I think most of us have had unpleasant experiences with yellow jackets and maybe even honeybees. Um, but the truth is these are just animals that are defending themselves. They're defending, um, they're defending their young or their, their colony. And, you know, they're not going to attack you unless they feel they have a good reason for it. These are not actively aggressive animals that are, you know, just being, being aggressive for the sake of it. So it's, it's important to, I think, respect that they are um, living, breathing organisms that have their own priorities and want to, want to be left alone, want to be left to their own devices. And if they're giving you trouble, it's because they feel that you're doing something uh, to impede that. Um, and third of all, wasps in general are just tremendously beneficial um, organisms. Um, even the ones that we think of as, as being very aggressive or unpleasant are very important members of the ecosystem. And you know, if you were to get rid of them, it would cause very harmful effects on the habitat as a whole. So I think it's, it's, it's good to keep a, a good amount of respect even for um, the insects that we've been kind of taught are, are very um, mean. <laughs> So our next group are the diptera. These are flies. Uh, diptera means two wings, and that's because flies um, have only one pair of functioning wings. The hind wings have been reduced into these little structures called haltiers, um, which the flies will use as a way of sort of maintaining equilibrium. It gives them a better sense of balance as they're flying around. Um, flies also tend to have these very large, very um, complex compound eyes. In fact, that's one of the handy ways of distinguishing them if you have these very large forward-facing um, compound eyes. That's a good, good indication that you're probably looking at a fly. Um, one other um, distinguishing feature is that the larvae of flies, which we call maggots, um, do not have any appendages and they don't have any, any legs. So if you ever find a larva out, out in nature and it doesn't have any visible legs on it, it's probably a fly larva. And this is another one of those groups that is just enormously diverse. Um, I think we're most, most familiar with like flies that feed on, you know, most anything, they'll feed on decaying um, animal carcasses or on food that's been left out. Um, but there are also plenty of um, flies that are pollinators. In fact, you know, every bit as important to the ecosystem as bees and wasps are. There are um, predators that will actively hunt other insects. Um, there are herbivores, there are parasites like this mosquito, and there are parasitoids that will feed on, on other insects, much the same way that wasps will. And last but certainly not least, we come to the Coleoptera. So um, beetles are, first off, they're the largest order of living things. One out of every four species known to science is a beetle. And um, we think 
part of the reason that they are so preposterously successful is uh, down to the way that they've modified their front wings. So the four wings have been modified into these hard cases called elytra, which will, when they're at rest, will cover the hind wings and protect them. And whenever the, the beetle wants to fly around, it can lift up its elytra, extend its hind wings and go flying. And this adaptation means that beetles can kind of go anywhere. They've been, you know, they've been turned into basically little altering vehicles. Um, they can dig into the ground, they can shove themselves under bark or under rocks, they can go diving into the water, and they don't need to worry about their wings getting um, damaged or messed up. And yeah, they're just, you know, generally these tremendously, tremendously successful animals um, occupy any sort of niche that you can imagine. Again, they can be herbivores, they can be predators, they can be pollinators. And there's even, I think, one group of beetles that are um, parasitic. Um, but if, if you start paying attention to the kind of insects that you see around, you'll find that most of the ones you're coming across are, are actually beetles. So uh, a very, very important group of animals in general. So that concludes our um, whirlwind tour through the most common insect orders. So we have time again for a few more questions. Great, yeah, we got a few more coming through in that last bit. Um, one question is, um, can ants sting? Yes, they can. Um, ants, um, ants are in fact just a, a group of wasps that have for the most part lost their wings and if any of you guys are familiar with like fire ants, um, fire ants will produce this very painful sting, which so, uh, quite a number of people are very terribly allergic to, which is part of why they're so dangerous. Um, there's also the very famous um, bullet ant, which lives in, I believe in Central America, which has um, the most painful sting of any insect in the world. It supposedly feels like you've been shot. So yes, um, ants definitely can sting, although most of the ones around here um, do not tend to have that ability. That is good to know. Um, could you talk a little bit about insect breathing? Ooh, yes, that's an excellent thing to talk about. So. Um, yeah, so insects, well, arthropods in general, um, do not have any sort of lungs the way that we, the way that we do. They don't have these, um, you know, big sacs inside of them that will expand with air and absorb oxygen. So insects are actually fairly advanced as far as, um, breathing goes. Um, they have these structures which are called um, a trachea, which will um, carry air from these external openings, which are called spiracles, um, and then will convey it through this ever branching network of little tubes all the way directly to the insect's cells. So it's it's almost like a like a reverse lung, sort of. It's, they have all these several different openings that go and get gradually narrower and more convoluted. I think, if I go back, if you see all of these circles here on this caterpillar, each one of those is a spiracle. So that is an opening into the insect's respiratory system. And then those will all lead into this network of little tubes that feed into its, um, its cells and deliver oxygen to it. And if you ever get a chance to look at maybe a wasp um, or a bee moving around, if you can take a moment to kind of um, observe it, you might see that its abdomen is kind of pulsing a little bit and it looks a lot like it's breathing. And that is in fact what it's doing. It's, it's expanding 
and contracting its abdominal cavity to produce a bit of pressure to try and draw air into its trachea to help oxygenate it. Very cool. Another question was, um, what is the type of fly that on the fly slide, um, the one that was in the bottom on the middle, it had like green eyes and it's eating another fly? Yeah. So this is called a robber fly. And yeah, these are, are very active predators. Um, they're, you can see they have these very large eyes. They have really amazing vision. They're super quick and agile in the air. Um, and they have these um, sharp claws at the ends that they can use to snatch their prey out of the air as they're flying around. So really, really cool, um, really cool insects. Great. I think that's um, all the questions we have for now. So um, let's get into the next bit. All right. So um, there are, um, a, I mean, there are all kinds of resources that you can look for for helping to identify insects. And I know some people like having a physical kind of guide to look at. And one of the challenges with insect identification is just that there are so many insects. And it's, it's very, very hard to find resources that are going to um, be really comprehensive and give you um, sort of the most diversity. Um, and the truth of the matter is that when you try and get down and identify insects um, to specific species, a lot of the times um, they're distinguished by these really, really tiny, minute anatomical details that you're never going to see unless you, you know, take the specimen and put it underneath a dissecting scope and really get in there and look at it. So um, most guides will give you a bit more of a general um, sort of survey of insect diversity. They might give you like a few specific species as like um, sort of example ones, or they might take you to, you know, like the genus level that is like, oh, it belongs to this rough genus. Um, but of the resources available, these are the three books that I would recommend. Um, the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects is kind of the the benchmark. It's very detailed, it's very well organized, and it's um, a, a really good one for taking out into the field and being able to flip through it and quickly get to at least a, a decent approximate ID. Um, there's also this um, Pacific Northwest Insects by Merrill Peterson. And um, this one has this one has a lot of species in, in it. And it's very um, um, it, it's much more uh, directed at, at sort of our, our local habitat. Now it is Pacific Northwest, so I don't it's not going to be as useful if you're in SoCal, for instance. Um, this really doesn't get into insects that live below sort of Northern California. Um, but if you guys are willing to wait a little bit, the second edition of the Field Guide to California Insects is going to be coming out in October. Um, this is being updated from the 1979 version and um, is probably going to be a very excellent um, field guide. And it's, it's going to be very relevant to anyone looking at California insects. Um, but again, all of these are going to be useful for kind of approximate IDs, but in many cases, you're probably gonna find insects. And aside from asking, you know, an expert in the field, you're not going to get um, a super crazy fine level of identification. And that's okay. The other really big online resources for insect ident identification are Bug Guide and iNaturalist. So I'm going to go onto the internet here. So this is Bug Guide. This is kind of the classic um, resource for insect identification, and it is specifically geared for um, North American insects. And 
the nice thing about bug guys it has this feature called the guide which is um, this series of nested pages where you can go in and look at different groups of arthropods and it's kind of nice if you have like a picture and you can go oh i think it kind of looked like that so you can then go into the the finer level look your way through and start going through finer and finer levels of identification. And this is, um, this is um, not, it's not, you know, sponsored by any kind of uh, research institution. It's all built by sort of um, individual users um, taking their knowledge and, and putting it into these pages. Um, but you can find kind of useful useful stuff on a lot of individual species. And then there are, you know, info about where they live and what they're related to and, and different things. Um, I personally, I find bug guides interface to be a little bit clunky. Um, you do have to do quite a bit of formatting of your photos to make them small enough to be um, hostable on the page. Um, it can take a while to get an identification and you're very much relying on there being um, members of the members on bug guide who are able to help you identify something. But it does have this nice feature called ID request where you can go in, you can just put your pictures up there and you know, someone will come along and if they know what it is, they can direct you to the um, page for it. And the nice thing about this is that it is geared specifically to um, arthropods and to insects. So you're not going to have to um, worry about, you know, lots of other things. The other resource is, of course, iNaturalist, which I'm guessing most, if not all of you are, are familiar with by now. And of course, this is a more um, general um, natural history kind of um, community for all different kinds of organisms. This is this is my feed. This is going to have sort of its own look to it, but um, iNaturalist is great. You know, you can post any kind of thing on here and you know, you don't even have to know what it is. It can be, you, you have no idea what it is. You can just put it up there and someone can come along and go, I know what that is or at least I know sort of what it must be. And then you can go in and, although to be honest, I'm actually not sure what this is. It is an insect, so we can be helpful to them. But the other nice thing about iNaturalist is that you have these um, different levels of identification. So if, if you don't know what something is, you can take it down, you know, as to the lowest level that you know, and then someone else can come along and give you a finer identification. And, you know, it's such a large community. There are lots of people who are um, going to be experts on a very particular group of animals or plants or fungi. Um, so, you know, generally very quickly, you're going to be able to get a reasonable identification um, from someone on here. And um, one of the other nice things that you can do is there are, um, tools for like subscribing to different um, different groups of organisms. So for instance, I am subscribed to these different genera of cicadas. So anytime someone observes one of these, it pops up in my feed and I can go and look at it 
and you know give give feedback if I agree with the identification I can agree with it or if I think it's something else I can give a new identification and there are even um, cool um, ways to build like pages for specific groups so I've created this one for cicadas in the western United States and you can set up parameters where it will collect all of the observations of that group in a given range so I can now just draw in every single cicada observation from the western United States and Canada and they're all in one place where I can go and um, identify them you can pull something up and do it So this is definitely um, a very helpful tool. It's probably gonna be the most user-friendly option for you because you can put anything on here. So I'm gonna go back to PowerPoint. There we go. So now I'm gonna give you guys just a few little tips for um, when you're photographing insects. Um, we actually, I mean, we, we sent out some stuff that included some of these guidelines uh, for this, um, for this talk, if, if you wanted to submit some photos. Um, but, you know, there, there's some of the obvious tips, like you want to, you know, just have general good kind of camera work. You want it to be in focus. You want the lighting to be okay. You want the re resolution to not be too bad. Um, but you don't. You don't need. Um, you don't need any fancy digital camera or anything like that. You can use the camera on your phone, and it will work great. I took these with my camera phone, and they're perfectly usable images. In fact, the nice thing about using your smartphone is that you can um, adjust your settings in your phone so that whenever you take a picture, it saves the the day and the time and it even saves the gps coordinates of where you took that photo so when you go to put that photo up on iNaturalist that metadata is attached to the photo already and it will just automatically put put the location in there for you so you don't need to go to a lot of trouble of like you know writing down in a notebook exactly where you were or where you found it uh, when you're taking pictures, it's good to let the insect fill up as much of the frame as possible. And if you can't get close enough with it, with the camera to do that, then it's fine to just crop the photo afterwards. But the big thing is that we don't, we don't care a huge amount about what's in the background. We, if we're trying to just identify the insect, then we can go in and, you know, crop the photo and just leave in all the pertinent details. Um, it's a good idea to get multiple angles of an insect. If you can get one of the side and one of the top, that's usually going to be good. Um, but um, if it's possible for you to get the underside, then, you know, that's often going to be useful. It's going to vary depending on what group of insect we're talking about. Um, but, you know, whenever I'm out in the field catching a cicada, I'm going to take a photograph of these three angles because um, sometimes like the underside is going to be a useful thing for trying to identify the species. Um, it's also really good to keep track of environmental details. So if you know what the weather was like, if you know what the, the temperature was when you saw the insect, if you can um, include, you know, what it was doing, what sorts of plants or what sort of habitat it was associated um, how many there were, if it was just the one insect or if there were a whole bunch of them. Um, and then one thing that sometimes gets overlooked is if you're dealing with insects that um, produce sound, is if you can get a recording of the audio, then that, that can be a really useful tool. That's definitely the case with, um, you know, grasshoppers and katydids, and it's definitely true with cicadas that sometimes you can get a, a species identification just from the audio recording. Um, and you don't need anything fancy. 
Uh, you can, I, mean, I use my, my iPhone to record audio. I just shoot a video and then I strip the audio off of the video and that works great. You know, as long as you're not getting interference from like wind noise and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that can be really useful. And then the other um, good thing to keep in mind is that um, you shouldn't be afraid to document every insect you find if you want to do that. Um, because, you know, it can be easy to feel like you're sort of spamming iNaturalist or something like that if you're just putting up dozens and dozens of images of, of different insects. Um, but the truth is, all of those observations are going to be valuable um, because all of them are providing data on, on where a species of insect is, when it's out, um, what it's doing. And I've definitely had experiences where, you know, someone, someone on iNaturalist will have, you know, posted, posted this cool bug that they found and I get super excited because it's it's a species that, you know, maybe no one's actually ever photographed before. And like we have a scientific paper from back in the 1920s or 30s. And then um, this is the first time that anyone's actually gone out and found it and bothered to take a photograph of it out in the wild. So um, you never know what sort of valuable thing you will be contributing to um, the scientific community just by going out and documenting uh, the sorts of animals that are in your backyard. I did have one other example on iNaturalist, just sort of showing you, you know, some, uh, an example of like good practices. So I found this beetle when I was out on a hike. Um, and it turned out that this is actually um, kind of a, a rare type of beetle. It's called a rain beetle. These spend the vast majority of their lives underground, and then they will emerge for only about a day um, during the first really heavy rains of fall. Um, so I had found this beetle, and you can see I took you know some pictures of what it looked like when it was in place as I found it, sticking out of this little burrow. So I took a couple pictures of that. And then I also wanted to get some better details. So I, I picked it up and got a shot of the underside and a picture of the top. And I posted it on iNaturalist. And um, I got a comment from this guy who knows stuff about rain beetles saying like, oh, it would be nice, nice if you could get a picture of the antennae. So I went back and looked through the photos I had taken and I noticed that um, one of them had actually a decent shot of the antennae. So I cropped that and, and added it on there. And because I had added that, this guy who is an expert on rain, rain beetles was able to narrow it down to species. So just you know, a good example of you, you never know what exactly is going to be the thing that clinches an identification. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea to be thorough if you can, um, because every detail is going to be useful. So we have a little bit of time left. I was gonna give us just some examples of some um, photos to help with kind of practicing identification a little bit. Um, these were some photos that um, Heidi, one of the Pepperwood volunteers, sent in. Beautiful photos. So you can see here, really excellent example. Um, they're in focus, and importantly, they're they're really close up, and you're getting a lot of detail in here. Um, you're able to see all of the different structures of the insect, and you can, you know tell a lot about what's going on with it. So when we look at this, I mean, probably, probably you can guess like, mm, that looks like it's a wasp 
or a fly or something. You know, it's definitely not a beetle. It doesn't have those hard wing cases. Um, it doesn't look like a bug. It doesn't have these piercing sucking mouth parts. So how would you know that this is maybe a wasp and not a beetle? And some good things to look for are the antennae. You can see that this insect has some pretty long um, antennae on it. They have these sort of elbowed structures to them. They bend at an angle right there. You can see that the eyes are not enormous on the head and also they face outward. They don't really face forward at all. They face outward to the side. And then you can see that the abdomen narrows into this little waist where it connects to the thorax. And those are all, you know, three details that are really good to tell you that this is a wasp and not a fly. By contrast, this insect here has these very short antennae. It's actually almost difficult to see them. These very little tiny stubs has these very large rounded eyes that face forward. And it has a body that's just sort of this continuous unit. It doesn't have a waist there. This is um, a fly. And, you know, <clears throat> flies technically are distinguished by the fact that they only have one pair of wings, but oftentimes it's very difficult when you're out in the field to be able to tell, um, like, you know, here you can't really tell, does this have two wings or four wings because they're folded up against its back. So this is a handier kind of way of looking at other features that will help you identify it. And then we have these weird things, which, you know, there's, they kind of look like a bunch of different things. Like they kind of look like maybe they're mosquito eaters or, you know, I don't know, maybe some kind of dragonfly or something. They have the, the long abdomen, they have these long wings. But the, the nice detail here that you can look for is you'll notice all these nice patterning on the wings. And if you zoom in, you can see that it's all of these individual scales. So that's a sign that this is um, a lepidoptera. This is a moth and not a, not a crane fly, not a, a dragonfly or something like that. So those were just a couple of quick examples from photos that you know I had right at my disposal. And the nice thing about um, a tool like iNaturalist is you don't have to get it right the first time. Someone will be able to come along and um, give you a more appropriate identification if what you put in there was incorrect. So that was um, all that I had for you guys. So we have um, a bit more time for some questions. Yeah, we definitely had quite a few questions coming in there. Um, so let's see, going back a little ways, um, one question was, what purpose do the hairs on legs fill? A lot of the images you've been sharing have um, show the, the little hairs on the flies or the beetles' legs. So, um, well, <laughs> there are lots of answers to that. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, hairs can serve all kinds of different functions for insects. Let's see. Yeah, we've got a few. I'm kind of hard to see. We've got a few little hairs on there. A few along here. Um, sometimes hairs are there as a form of insulation. So they can actually help keep the insect a little bit warm. Um, sometimes they're helping to keep, um, keep it clean. They're keeping particles and stuff from clinging directly to the surface of the insect. Um, sometimes they're there to help with grooming. Um, you can, you know, if you have structures on the forelimbs that the insect wants to kind of clean itself, it can, can um, literally just sort of brush its face, wipe down its eyes and things like that with a little, a little brush, a little comb that adds on its forelimbs. Um, 
sometimes they can help with traction. They can sort of get help it get a grip on on different surfaces. So there's, I mean, the answer is that there's lots of different functions to hairs. Great. Um, let's see. There are also a couple questions about various various biting bugs, which I think is pretty relevant to all of us if we're trying to get to know insects a little better and we want to make sure we're maybe not going to put ourselves in, in any danger. Um, one question was about the sand flies in New Zealand. Um, and their bite is very painful and wondering if that's venomous and that's why it hurts so bad? Um, a lot of times, oh gosh, flies. I don't believe that any kind of flies are actually venomous. Yeah, I don't think there are any flies that are venomous. Um, what will sometimes happen is that some, some biting insects, the saliva, either the saliva has some enzymes in it that are kind of designed to break down tissue. If it's a kind that's like drinking fluids and stuff that helps, helps to break down the tissue and make it easier to drink. Um, a lot of the times though, it is because the saliva just contains stuff in it that causes an allergic reaction. So that's the reason that um, mosquito bites end up causing that little welt um, is because that's your body reacting um, to the, the mosquito saliva. Um, and uh, I don't know specifically about New Zealand sand flies, but um, I, would, I would imagine that's probably the case there, that it's a combination of the fact that just the, the actual physical damage that the bite causes along with an allergic reaction from the saliva. But I don't actually know that, so could try looking that up. Yeah, um, and I, I also want to just, um, I'm looking at the time here. We can definitely take some more questions. There's lots in the chat that I'd like to bring up, but um, also at this point for anyone who does want to head out, I just want to say thank you for joining us um, today. And this class, as we said at the beginning, is re being recorded. So we're going to post that on our YouTube channel after um, after we get that recording. And also um, stay tuned to Pepperwood's social media and our website for um, other upcoming um, online classes and, and events such as this one. So yeah, thanks again. Also, I will be um, sending out an email with a, a link to a survey and we'd love your feedback on what you thought about this class. Um, we're always trying to improve what we offer. Um, so your input is, is really appreciated. So keep an eye out for that email. I'll send both the recording of this class as well as that survey. Um, and let's see, we've got some other interesting questions here. Um, are there any insects that might be harmed by being handled? Like if you're trying to get a good photo of it, make some observations. Um, so, I, I will address kind of what's maybe a bit of an urban myth, or at least a common misconception. Um, I, I know some people sometimes say that like if you handle, touch a butterfly's wings, that it will no longer be able to fly. And um, that is untrue. Um, handling, you know, like a, a moth or a butterfly is definitely going to rub some of the scales off of the, um, the insect's wings, but it's not going to harm its ability to fly as long as you're being you know, gentle with the insect. The big thing is just that you don't want to be, <laughs> you don't want to be holding on crazy tight to any of these because they are small creatures that can get injured if you're too rough with them. Um, and certainly, you know, if it's something like, well, <laughs> presumably you're not going to go out and try and, and grab a bee, for instance, and try and hold it in your hand as you're photographing it because it'll try and sting you. But a, a bee is a good example. Like honeybees, um, when they sting you, uh, the stinger comes off and then the, the bee will um, die shortly afterwards because it's, it's had to injure itself in order to sting you. So that, that's an instance where you wouldn't want to be causing that kind of response unnecessarily. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the biggest danger 
is if you have an insect that has just molted, if it has just emerged, like if you come and you find a butterfly that's still hanging from its cocoon, or you find a cicada on a tree that's just emerged from its little shell, um, those insects are um, still going to be really soft and they're going to be very, very fragile. So um, anytime you see an insect that is still associated with um, the exoskeleton that it just molted out of, that's a good sign that probably it's still very delicate. And if you try and handle it, you're going to cause damage to it um, that it will not be able to um, heal from. It's going to um, permanently damage like the wings, for instance, the wings are going to be very delicate. So by the time the insect hardens and, and gets that nice firm exoskeleton, those injuries are going to be kind of solidified in place and the insect is going to end up being de um, deformed if it's not um, you know, gravely injured outright. So that, that is the one instance where you really do want to be careful um, and, and, try and try and be kind of hands off of, about it. But the nice thing is when insects are in that stage, when they're um, still, still fresh, um, they're not going to be moving around a lot. So you can get your camera nice up and, and close to them and not have to worry about them running away. Great. Um, another question, and this is something I would wonder about as well, is there an easy way to tell a wasp from a bee? That's a good question. Um, well, let's go back. So, you know, there aren't a huge amount of hard and fast rules, like, or at least things that are going to be super useful. Um, but um, certainly, if you ever see um, a bee that is um, got kind of a layer of fuzz on it, so if you look at a bumblebee or a honeybee, something like that, it's going to be very fuzzy. That's a sign that it is, in fact, a bee and not a wasp. You can see this wasp is um, much more glossy. It doesn't have a lot of long hairs on it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not going to have quite that same appearance. Um, there are some very small kinds of bees um, that look a little more waspy. Um, one other thing is you'll find um, a lot of bees will carry pollen on their hind legs. So the, the hind leg has been modified. It's a bit thicker. Oftentimes you'll see little pads of pollen that it has accumulated on there. Um, and that's, that's a uh, a decent sign that it's a bee. Um, but it's also um, kind of a, a nice demonstration of the fact that, that wasps and bees are not really all that different from each other. They serve a lot of the same ecological roles. Um, and, um, you know, if you put it up on, on iNaturalist, someone will be quite happy to correct you if you get it wrong the first time. So, um, you can leave it as just a uh, hymenoptera if you want to, if you don't want to be too specific about it. Great, super helpful. Um, and there was another question actually saying that um, this has been so helpful in clarifying, you know, getting to know insects without being so overwhelming um, and wondering if you'll be teaching more classes anywhere, Elliot. Um, well, unless you enroll as a freshman at Sonoma State University, I don't, in biology, I don't know that you will be seeing me at least um, soon. Um, I'm hoping that uh, next spring we'll be able to hold this class and actually be able to get out into the field proper and, and get our hands on some insects to, to look at and identify. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't have any classes coming up yet. But I appreciate I appreciate the interest. That's very gratifying. Yeah, we'd love to sometime in the future be able to get actually out into the field at Pepperwood with you, Elliot, to lead us in exploring some of these creatures. Um, uh, let's take a couple more quick questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, one question was about centipedes, like what category of, of creature is a centipede and do they bite, which I would say yes. Centipedes are actually among the more dangerous um, arthropods as far as their bite goes. And 
they also kind of defy the the general rule, which is that, you know, if you're talking about a scorpion or even about a spider, really big scorpions and really big spiders, the bite is actually less dangerous. But the bigger a centipede is, the more dangerous its bite is. So those like really big sort of Central American ones um, could easily kill you if they bite you. And a number of the local ones around here, if it bites you, it's not going to kill you, but you're going to be very, very unhappy for a while afterwards. Um, centipedes um, are closely related to millipedes. They, they're um, this group called the, the myriapods. Um, and the big distinguishing feature between centipedes and millipedes is that um, if you look at the individual body segments of a centipede, it has one pair of legs on each body segment, whereas a millipede has two pairs of legs on each body segment. Uh, this was an interesting question earlier. Um, could you name some edible bugs? I know that there's definitely parts of the world where folks eat bugs. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, lots of, lots of insects are technically edible. Um, you know, there are different kinds of caterpillars that people will feed on. Um, I know like in Australia, uh, indigenous people in Australia would find these big caterpillars um, that would live in tree stumps and they would eat those. Certainly parts of Africa, they feed on the very large caterpillars that they have there. Um, I know crickets are eaten in several areas of the world. Um, and that's, I mean, crickets are very easy to, um, easy to breed and easy to keep in large numbers. And then you can just fry them up. Um, interestingly enough, cicadas are also edible. Um, back in historical days, like those 17 year emergences, people would go out and right as the cicadas are coming out of their, um, coming out of their shells and they're still nice and soft, you can gather a whole bunch of them and fry them up and eat them. So um, yeah, a lot of insects are um, perfectly edible. We just culturally are not very accustomed to thinking of them that way. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, great. Well, I'm looking at the time. I'm seeing it's 1130, uh, a couple minutes after 1130. So at this point, I think we will wrap things up. Um, I want to thank everyone for all your questions. And thank you, Elliot, for um, a great presentation in class. Um, lots of folks are thanking you in the chat, saying it was really um, informational and easy to understand. So uh, we very much appreciate it. And I hope everyone out there gets a chance to get out and um, get to know some more insects this weekend and explore iNaturalist, it's a great tool as well. So yeah, thank yeah. you again. Thank you all for coming.